folks, welcome to lecture six. In this lecture, we're going to use what we learned last time when we focus on plant reproduction and apply it to structures that you're more familiar with. Namely, we're going to explore the differences between flowers, fruit, and seeds. I'm gonna spend some time doing dissections of these structures, which may on the one hand seem a little simple, but when you dig in, there's actually a lot of complexity there and a good chance for us to learn. If you wanna follow along, one easy thing you could do is to go to a local florist. A lily is a great example of a flower that you could dissect along with me. Remember, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to meet with you in a Zoom one-on-one -on -one office hours. Let's get started. In this lecture, we're going to extend our knowledge of plant reproduction by talking about flowers, fruit, and seeds. The next lecture is going to be devoted to our group plant experiment. As we start talking about flowers, fruit, and seeds, it's important to keep in mind that we're gonna have a specific focus on flowering plants. But gymnosperms do not make flowers and still produce seeds. So seed plants include angiosperms and gymnosperms, but in this lecture, we're gonna be largely focused on the angiosperms or flowering plants. The first thing to notice is that the angiosperms or flowering plants are the most successful group of plants on earth. If you have a look at this figure, you can see that the vast majority of plants on earth are indeed flowering plants. This figure is actually a little outdated. There is nearly 300,000 species of flowering plants. Now, I know you recognize things like pine trees, but one of the thing that's interesting is that pine trees don't even account to a thousand species and ferns are about 11,000 species. The mosses and their relatives, including things like hornworts and liverworts, are actually more diverse than ferns, but we don't know very much about them because they tend to be kind of small, obscure plants. Either way, the planet is dominated by angiosperms. A good question would be, why? Why are angiosperms so important? Why are they so diverse relative to all the other plant groups? One reason is that they share several key features. These key features include flowers, fruit, and vessel elements. Two other features tend to be associated with angiosperms, but are not restricted to them. That includes seeds and pollen. It's important to remember that both seeds and pollen also occur in gymnosperms. One way to gain insight into angiosperms is to have a look at the anatomy of a flower. Recall from our previous conversation that a flower is a combination of both reproductive and non-reproductive whorls. The whorls are modified leaves. So on this hibiscus flower, for example, the petals are really obvious, and you can see that they are the product of modified leaves, maybe just with some extra coloring, but the other parts of the flower are actually the product of modified leaves as well. If you take a top-down view, on the outside are the sepals. The sepals tend to be green and photosynthetic. The next whorl are the petals. Petals tend to be colored to attract pollinators. The male part of the flower are the stamens, and the female part of the flower is the carpel or carpels. When you look at the carpel more closely, you see that the carpel includes the stigma, the style, and the ovary. The stigma, which I oftentimes refer to as the sticky stigma, is the point at which pollen lands. The style tends to be a long neck that extends to the ovary, and inside the ovary are the ovules, each of which, when fertilized, will develop into a seed. The stamens, or male part of the flower, include two parts, the filament and the anther, both of which are collectively referred to as the stamen. One of the really interesting things that you can do is dissect a flower. This not only gives you insight into how angiosperms reproduce, but it also gives you some really good insights into their structure. 
One of the first things you'll notice on this hibiscus flower is that we have our petal whorl. Remember, the petal whorl is a non-reproductive whorl, but it's usually colored. If you look closely at this hibiscus, you'll see that we have the style, which goes down from the ovary at the base all the way up to the stigma. This is the sticky stigma. And then on hibiscus, what you have is coming off of the style, you have our stamens. So these small frilly looking things here are the stamens. And of course, at the tip, tip of each one is the anther. And so you can see that the anthers are where you have a lot of pollen. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this flower around. And on the base, what you're going to see are the sepals. So I'm going to pull those off first. And if I do this carefully enough, usually I'll use our razor blade here to kind of help me out a little bit. This way we kind of get access to the very base and you can see that the petals actually extend all the way down here. So the petal, each petal comes all the way down to the base and in here is where you're going to find the ovary. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull off the petals. I know it may seem like I'm being unnecessarily cruel to this flower, but I'm going to pull off our petals here. Okay, so now we have our petals. And now a lot of the parts are like a little bit more visible. So again, you can see that this style goes all the way from the sticky stigma all the way down into the ovary. The petals again are a non-reproductive whorl. And so the next thing I can do is I can slowly shave away at the very base of the ovary. I know this probably is a little bit of out of, out of focus for you, but it'll come into focus in just a moment. So I'm slowly shaving away here. Got to be patient. Work nice and carefully and slowly. Ah, now things are going to start to come into mind. And if you look closely here, what you'll see is that you have the ovary on the inside here and lots of teeny little ovules. Now I'll zoom in on those in a moment, but each of those ovules has the chance to become fertilized and each one of them can then become a seed, right? So again, the really important parts here that we have to keep in mind are the sticky stigma, the long style, the ovary, the petals, the sepals, which I've pulled off. And then of course, at the top here on hibiscus, we have the filament and the anthers, which comprise the stamens. So again, a lot to learn from taking apart a flower. And I'd encourage you to actually go outside and see if you can find one yourself and take it apart and try to find these parts.
Now that we have an understanding of the anatomy of a flower, let's talk about how we get from a flower to a seed. Reproduction in angiosperms is a complex process that's referred to as double fertilization. A pollen grain lands on the sticky stigma, a pollen tube then grows all the way down and enters the structure which we call the megagametophyte or embryo sac and delivers not one but two sperm. One of the sperm cells actually ends up fertilizing the egg and the other sperm cell actually ends up fertilizing the central cell. Once the egg is fertilized, of course you know that that then results in the development of the zygote and eventually the embryo, but that central cell, when fertilized, eventually develops into a special nutritive tissue that nourishes the seed called the endosperm. The ploidy of the endosperm is really interesting. You can see that there are three haploid nuclei here, so we call them 3N. The endosperm is triploid. So let's have a quick look at the anatomy of a flower and the key features in the process of double fertilization. We're going to start by drawing our generic flower here. And at this point, you'll have to forgive my artistry, but you should be able to identify the main structures, which are going to include first the stigma, second the style, and then last the ovary, all three of which together form the carpal. And then moving on, we're going to have the anther and the filament. Those two structures end up forming the stamen. Now on the inside is where it gets really interesting. So on the inside of the flower, we kind of have some extension of the ovary wall into a protective covering that kind of looks like a horseshoe. This is called the integument layer. And it's important to notice them because they end up forming the seed coat. And then on the inside, of the integument layer is where you have some of the more detailed structures. So you have two cells that surround the egg cell. Remember the egg is haploid. These two cells are called synergids. And then on the opposite end, you have three cells, which are called antipodals. In the middle, you have two nuclei that are haploid. And this is called the central cell. All the parts together, it's fair to call the ovule. But it's important to note that the ovule would include those integument layers. And so now the interesting part is what happens in double fertilization. So if I redraw my flower nice and big here, We know how to label the parts now. 
Hopefully yours looks a little better than mine. Remember we're drawing that ovule. We have our cells. Pollen is going to end up landing on our sticky stigma. And then a pollen tube is going to go all the way down. And it actually ends up popping or destroying one of the synergids, and it delivers two sperm. Remember, sperm are haploid, one of which is going to go to that egg cell, and the other of which is going to go to that central cell. That makes that central cell triploid, or 3N, and of course, the fusion of sperm and egg makes a zygote. Now the interesting part is that once this process is done, the ovary wall, which I am coloring in red here, ends up ripening, and that's what ends up becoming the fruit. So notice that we have, in the end, uh, on the inside here, you're going to end up with basically a developing embryo, which represents the next sporophyte generation. Surrounded by a bunch of tissue, which is 3N, right? And that 3N tissue is the endosperm. And all of this is surrounded by the fruit. Now that we have an understanding of the process of double fertilization, let's have a closer look and think about the difference between fruit and seeds. A good question now is, what is a fruit? Fruit is derived from a mature, ripened ovary, so it's something that forms after fertilization. Once double fertilization has happened, the ovary wall ripens and encloses the fertilized ovules. In general, the fruit always enclose the seeds. There are some exceptions, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The function of fruit is pretty clear. Fruit is a means of seed dispersal. So we eat fruit, Sometimes we might eat the seeds, and then we transport them to another location. In the wild, animals eat fruit, oftentimes consuming the seeds, but not digesting the seeds, later depositing them in a new habitat. The seeds of flowering plants have three components. They have an embryo, which is diploid, a seed coat, which is diploid, and nutritive tissue, which is triploid. Remember that the nutritive tissue is the result or the product of double fertilization and ends up developing into the triploid endosperm. The whole structure is surrounded by the ripened ovary, which is the fruit. One kind of fun question in this context is fruit or vegetable? Botanically speaking, what most people call vegetables, like in a grocery store, are actually fruit. So it's important to keep in mind that botanically at least, when we say vegetable, we're talking about parts of the plant that are formed from non-reproductive or vegetative tissues. So a good example is lettuce. So lettuce is a vegetable because the leaves are formed from a vegetative part of the plant. But it's really important to note that lettuce is actually a flowering plant. So if left on its own, eventually it's going to form fruit. Now we don't usually eat lettuce fruits, at least I've never heard of anybody doing that, but because it's an angiosperm, it's going to eventually form a fruit. Something that's a little confusing is that when you see a cucumber, most people call cucumbers vegetables, even though when you cut them open, you can see that they have seeds on the inside. That means that a cucumber is, at least botanically speaking, a fruit. 
it can be a little confusing, so let's have a look at some examples. Now one of the fun things that I like to do in PLB10 is start looking at the sort of food that we eat. So here's an apple, that's great, and here's a carrot. So one good question you might ask yourself is why do we call this a vegetable and this a fruit? And maybe to make it a little bit more interesting, um, what's this? Is it a fruit or is it a vegetable? And then of course, even trickier, what's broccoli? Not all people like broccoli, but it sure is interesting from a botanical perspective. Let's have a closer look. So first, let's start with an apple. So here's our apple. And one of the things that you'll notice about an apple is if I cut it open, Of course, we have seeds. So the good and important lesson here is that fruit contain seeds. Tastes pretty good too. Now, what's that mean about carrots? Well, if I chop into a carrot, there's no seeds. If I flip it over, you might kind of wonder what this is. And believe it or not, this is the top of the carrot. So the carrot grows down. So this is part of a tap root. And really interesting thing about carrots is that the stem on a carrot is actually really, really a thin disc at the very, very top of the plant. And that green stuff that you see coming off, well, those are leaves. And so a carrot is something we call a vegetable because it's made of vegetative tissue. There are no seeds. Well, that brings us to the bell pepper. So the bell pepper is pretty interesting. Most people would call the bell pepper a vegetable. If we cut it open, one of the things you'll notice is that on the inside, of course, we have seeds. So botanically speaking, a bell pepper is actually a fruit. Last, of course, is broccoli. What the heck is broccoli? Well, of course, there's no seeds here. But one of the cool things you'll notice is that if I zoom in close, this is actually the flower. So these are many, many, many flowers on top of broccoli. This is the broccoli stem. Now, of course, if broccoli makes flowers, it must also make fruit, just like something like lettuce. A lot of people might go, well, where's lettuce fruit? We never eat lettuce fruit. That's true, and the reason why is because only rarely do we let these kinds of uh, plants get to the point where they're going to produce fruit, but eventually, all flowering plants, including things like lettuce and broccoli, are going to have to make fruit. The fruit is the product of a ripened ovary on a flower. I'm off to make a salad. Hope that was helpful.
So now that we understand the anatomy of a seed and the anatomy of flowers, and maybe a distinction between fruit and seeds, let's have a closer look at the function of seeds. Before we go on, let's quickly review the life cycle of land plants. This is called alternation of generations because we switch in between two multicellular adult stages. One, the gametophyte has one copy of chromosomes per cell, it's haploid, and two, the sporophyte, which is diploid and thus has two copies of chromosomes per cell. The next question should be pretty obvious. Where on this are we going to end up finding a seed? Now that you've had some time to think about this, let's quickly review. So the gametophyte is the multicellular haploid adult that produces the gametes, sperm and egg. So we know that A and B are both out. There is not going to be any embryo there. And remember, inside a seed, we have to have an embryo, a developing diploid structure that's going to represent the next sporophyte generation. These two gametes fuse in a process called fertilization to make a zygote. Now remember, a zygote is diploid, but it is only unicellular. So it's not correct to say that inside a seed is a zygote. Instead, we have to undergo a little bit of mitosis in order to get to an embryo stage. That's D. So really the best answer here that I can think of is D. E is the sporophyte. That's the next adult generation. So it's pretty different than the embryo. So just as a review, a seed always contains a diploid embryo, representing the next sporophyte generation. And seeds are remarkable because they can germinate when conditions are just right. Recall that the seed contains not only that embryo and nutritive tissue, but it's also protected by a seed coat. So seeds can have remarkable longevity. This is a really good example of the longevity of seeds. This is one of the oldest known seeds that actually was planted and developed into a viable plant. And this was something that was found in an archeological dig that was over 2000 years old. With a little bit of care, that seed regrew into an, a new adult plant. So seeds have incredible longevity. We're going to end by thinking about seeds and how they're dispersed. And there are lots of different strategies used by seeds for dispersal. They include things like water in the form of a coconut, wind like a dandelion seed, and of course animals like humans which enjoy fruit but sometimes consume seeds and then deposit them in new habitats. In this lecture, we talked about the difference between flowers, fruit, and seeds. We did a quick review of the anatomy of a flower, and I showed you a brief dissection of hibiscus. We then went on to define seed anatomy, and we discussed the function of seeds and how they were formed in a process called double fertilization in angiosperms, or flowering plants. Please make sure that you can do a rough sketch of double fertilization process and label the anatomy of a flower. Remember, if you have questions or need extra assistance, please don't hesitate to send me an email and I'm happy to set up a Zoom chat. Thanks and I'll see you next time.